By all rights, the high holiday season and the great Alenu in particular should present serious problems for me. I have long been a critic of male hierarchical God language. I see such language as rooted in and reinforcing patterns of domination in society and as offering an understanding of the divine human relationship that is deeply alienating rather than nourishing. As Mary Daly argued many decades ago, if God is male, then the male is God. If God is king, judge, warrior, and overwhelming and distant power over us, then God becomes a model of and for all the many schemes of dominance human beings concoct for ourselves. When I pray, I try to avoid melech language, the language of kingship, wherever possible. In the traditional blessing formula, I replace melech ha'olam, king of the world, with ruach ha'olam, spirit of the world. At the time I wrote Standing Again at Sinai in 1990, I saw God as king as an image that can't be redeemed or transformed and argued that it should be excised from our religious vocabularies. But on Rosh Hashanah, this image is impossible to avoid. It feels like we encounter God, the Lord, King, and Judge on steroids. His sovereignty is everywhere. In the Elenu Malchuyot, the great Elenu that opens the section of the Musaf service on God's kingship, we are invited to fall flat on the floor, prostrating ourselves before God, the king. Actually, the word king appears three times in one phrase. We bow down lifne melech malche hamlochim before the king, king of kings. Although the Elena was recited daily as part of every service, enacting submission adds a different weight to the words on Rosh Hashanah and again on Yom Kippur. For a lot of years, I rebelled against this imagery. I found the high holidays very difficult, especially Yom Kippur, which I approached as a hunger strike against the God of the prayer book. But for quite a while now, Rosh Hashanah has been my favorite holiday. And for several years, the Elenu Malchuyot has been one of my favorite Rosh Hashanah moments. Why? What happened? My attitude toward Rosh Hashanah began to shift the year that my mother was dying. I recited the Unitana Tokef that year, knowing that she would not live to the next Rosh Hashanah. It occurred to me, and I suppose I should say, duh, that the prayer was not about God intervening in the world and judging us, determining whether we were going to live or die. It was about the fragility and uncertainty of our existence. The previous Rosh Hashanah, my mother had seemed fine. We had no idea that she would wake up one morning with a severe headache and never be herself again. I was struck by how powerfully the words of the Unitana Tokev captured the things I was feeling. The unbelievable suddenness of change, the reality of impermanence, the inescapability of mortality, and the ultimate uncertainty and uncontrollability of our lives. Gradually, and it was a long process, this moment opened me to relinquishing the idea of the prayer book as offering an understanding of God that I had to accept or reject. Rather, I came to see it as eliciting a variety of feeling states that I, and probably most people, experience at different times in relation to the universe. Awe, gratitude, powerlessness, agency, surrender, longing, love, anger, sorrow, and so on. The hierarchical images of God that I had once dismissed came to be important to me as reminders of human insignificance in the face of the powerful forces of creativity and destructiveness in the cosmos. These forces are what I mean when I use the word God. 
Rosh Hashanah asks us to negotiate an enormous and productive tension between our smallness and our power, surrender and agency, between what we can control and what we can't. During the whole high holiday period, we're called on to examine our lives and think about who we have been and who we want to be, to do tshuva, to turn toward our best selves. And at the same time, the images of God, the King and judge are telling us that ultimately we're not in charge. We can't decide who shall live and who shall die. All we can do, and it's not nothing, is to alter the evilness of the decree. This tension is nicely captured in a lovely concept I learned in a college existentialism course many decades ago, throne freedom. We're born thrown into a world not of our own making, a particular historical moment, a particular place, a particular family and people, a set of concrete circumstances of privilege, marginalization, some complex combination of both. And no matter how comfortable or constrained our circumstances, there are always choices we can and have to make within them. Rosh Hashanah asks us to accept what we can't change and have the courage to change what we can. The great Alenu is for me the supreme moment of one side of this tension. It is the moment when I try to give up my white upper middle class illusion of control and align myself with and surrender to what is. On the first day of Rosh Hashanah in 2016, when I prostrated myself on the floor of jazz at Lincoln Center, it suddenly hit me with enormous force that Trump could win the presidency, a possibility I had not allowed myself to entertain until that moment. I got up completely shaken and also with a profound sense of my situatedness in a larger universe over which I ultimately have little control. Did I and do I want to align myself with that reality? No, I don't, absolutely not. But it's only when I stop fighting or trying to deny reality, stop pretending that it isn't really happening, that I can think clearly about my responsibilities in whatever the situation and reflect on how I want to act. It strikes me that the great Elenu has particular relevance and power this Rosh Hashanah in the midst of the COVID pandemic. With the possible exception of the epidemiologists among us, few people could have imagined last year that we would be attending BJ on the web this holiday season. Our lives have been turned inside out and upside down. We don't know how long the scourge will last or how it will ultimately affect us and our families, our country and the world. This year, when we fall to the floor for the great Elenu, and perhaps alone in a room or with only close family or friends, those who haven't tried it before may want to try it for the first time, can we accept and align ourselves with this pandemic reality? Can we truly take in that this is what is? Can we do it not in a spirit of fatalism and passivity but with a deep recognition that this is what is happening right now. We did not choose it, but it is a context in which we need to make decisions and get on with our lives for the foreseeable future. It is possible that bowing down before what is can help us reflect more deeply on who we want to be in the new year and where the possibilities for tshuva lie.